Uh, thank you very much for letting me uh, present uh, work that I did uh, uh, parallel to my PhD thesis in Heidelberg uh, in the last few years. Uh, I'm uh, right now at the Perimeter Institute uh, Quantum Intelligence Lab in Waterloo in Canada, uh, lovely known as the Pickle, and uh, that is where I'm going to continue the, the work uh, that, I'm, that I'm presenting here. Uh, the title of my talk is can we trust phase diagrams produced by artificial neural networks? Which is a very provocative title. Um, in the last few years, uh, phase diagrams have been produced by artificial neural networks in so many different uh, physical systems. And uh, they have reproduced uh, phase diagrams of so many really complicated uh, physical systems like uh, many body localization, gate theories. Uh, but there is a big problem. We don't really know what, it, what they do. So uh, it could be that uh, when we apply these neural networks to produce phase diagrams where uh, the physical system is unknown, that uh, some people publish a paper, propose there is a phase transition, and it could be completely wrong since uh, we have no clue if we can trust these phase diagrams or not. So uh, this means also, so far, uh, even though uh, one has, uh, many people have reproduced uh, phase diagrams of many physical systems. Uh, uh, no new, fundamentally new physics was found uh, by applying these procedures. So uh, what, what am I going to talk about? So at first I'm going to, uh, since uh, we, we have a very broad audience, so I'm going to uh, motivate uh, what, why we do what we do. Uh, um, that we calculate phase diagrams, then I'm going to introduce very briefly several machine learning algorithms and how they are applied to uh, discover phase transitions. So at the one hand, uh, uh, the first method that was proposed uh, was unsupervised learning, artificial feed-forward neural networks, how they are applied to uh, Monte Carlo configurations. Um, then we're going to talk about unsupervised learning, about principal component analysis, uh, briefly introduce a variation autoencoder, and at the end, uh, the uh, most important part of this talk is the interpretation of, the, uh, of machine learning, of uh, uh, artificial feed for neural networks, so that we uh, will understand what these neural networks learn in order to classify phases and calculate phase diagrams. Uh, Everything is introduced at the easing model first, and uh, later we go to uh, SU2 lattice gate theory. So, what do what do we want to do? Uh, we want to calculate phase diagrams. Uh, the phase diagram, uh, the easy, the easiest phase diagram that uh, we want to calculate uh, uh, is the phase diagram of ma magnets. The simplest model uh, that uh, where we know everything about uh, uh, is the easing model on the square lattice. Um, which has a paramagnetic phase uh, above some well-known critical temperature and a uh, ferromagnetic phase uh, below the critical temperature. And this will be our toy model where we introduce uh, all these uh, um, neural networks and see uh, if they can reproduce the phase diagram successfully. Then later, we are uh, interested in uh, uh, QCD, in the uh, confinement, deconfinement phase transition in QCD. Uh, sadly, this is way too complicated. This, uh, uh, that's why we're going to restrict ourselves to a simpler model. So uh, this phase transition is, uh, is this phase transition, so between uh, free quartz and gluons and the bound hadrons. Um, while QCD is normally uh, described by uh, uh, SU3 gauge theory, so the gluons are uh, are bosons that obey SU3 symmetry. Uh, uh, we uh, also assume that uh, um, we have infinitely heavy quarks, so uh, they, they don't move, and uh, we don't calculate uh, uh, particles uh, in a continuous space, but we put them on a four-dimensional lattice in this case. Um, so what is this confinement, deconfinement phase transition? So this is uh, what happens when uh, uh, we go from here to here so that uh, all the quarks and gluons find together to uh, build a stable nuclei uh, 
where quarks and gluons don't, uh, don't fly away again. Okay, so uh, what, uh, what is the general physics setting that, that we deal with? So uh, uh, our goal is to determine the ma uh, macroscopic phase diagrams from a microscopic description, so the Hamiltonian for example. Um, uh, determining the phase diagrams means we need to determine the existence of different phases, we want to pin down the exact locations of the phase transitions and uh, we uh, want to find the dominant characteristics of the phase transitions. So uh, we want to uh, uh, so we, we want to know what, what kind of phases exist. So we could we could al already start uh, by assuming uh, all the phases that, that we know exist, and we all only want to uh, know the uh, location of the phase transition. That is what you usually do when you apply supervised learning. But uh, with unsupervised learning, we can determine the existence of phases. With uh, supervised learning, we can pin down the phase transition, and uh, if we uh, interpret, we will we will later see that uh, we can also find uh, some uh, dominant characteristics of these phases. So, uh, how how uh, do we uh, do we normally do that? So before we had all the artificial intelligence framework, all the machine learning algorithms, um, we started with some. Uh, Hamiltonian, here we see the, the Easing model on the square lattice. Uh, so the Hamiltonian of the Easing model is uh, uh, just minus, minus J. J. J is positive in the sense of ferromagnetic uh, Easing model. The sum over uh, uh, neighboring, uh, the nearest neighbor spins uh, of uh, the product of uh, uh, neighboring spins. And uh, uh, you normally take two paths. On the one hand, uh, there is some extremely bright physicist who determines symmetry invariance, which translate to uh, possible order parameters, which can be uh, uh, finite or uh, or zero in the respective phases. So, in the case of uh, the Easing model of, of the ferromagnetic Easing model, we have an order parameter which uh, is given by the magnetization. So. Uh, this uh, M of S means that this is the magnetization evaluated on one single spin sample, spin configuration. And uh, uh, the order parameter that determines uh, in what phase you are in is the expectation value of uh, uh, the magneti magnetization evaluated on a spin single spin sample. Uh, the magnetization takes on a finite value in the ferromagnetic phase and uh, zero value in the paramagnetic phase and uh, you see a steep change of the uh, magnetization at the uh, phase transition. So this is what the very bright intelligent physicist does. On the other hand, we performed uh, Monte Carlo simulations um, where we evaluate the order parameter on. And uh, now uh, what, uh, what Julian did, he replaced the Monte Carlo simulation with an artificial neural network. What we are doing, we are replacing the physical deduction of the order parameter with a neural network. So, uh, is it possible that uh, a machine learning algorithm figures out what uh, the dominant order is or uh, uh, what the main characteristics of these phases are in order to uh, automatically calculate the, the phase? Uh, phase diagram, figure out the phase transition. Um, since, uh, so this is a very new field. Uh, it started in uh, 2016, 2017, and uh, in just a uh, very little time, uh, all these uh, machine learning uh, approaches have reproduced uh, phase diagrams in many diff different systems. So this was, the, this was the first paper by Juan and Roger. Uh, they mainly just looked at the easing model and uh, went on to find phase transition in, uh, in uh, spin ice systems. Then uh, a little more complicated was, uh, uh, was this work by, by Everett. Uh, he looked at uh, uh, the phase diagram of many body localization. Um, here, um, people tried to uh, extend uh, their phase diagrams to regions where the phase uh, where the sign problem is present, and uh, uh, on this page, people found that uh, artificial intelligence has a lot of 
uh, problems finding the phase transition in uh, uh, finding the BKT phase transition. Uh, and uh, the last one is our work that I did together with Manuel, who is now at Lille, uh, where we examined the phase diagram of uh, uh, SE2 Lattice Gauge Theory, which I will discuss at the end of the talk. So, uh, this slide, uh, on this slide we can see an overview over all the methods that have been developed to, uh, uh, to study phase diagrams using machine learning. Uh, there are supervised machine learning algorithms, there are unsupervised uh, machine learning algorithms and uh, hybrid machine learning algorithms. Uh, the first one that was proposed uh, was a standard feed-forward neural network, uh, which, uh, so the, the paper is really easy to reproduce, but back then uh, it did, uh, this framework did not exist, so it was a, a, a pretty, pretty big deal. Um, this feed-forward neural network uh, is so far also the uh, most powerful uh, machine learning algorithm when it comes to uh, finding phase transitions in, uh, in complicated physical systems. Um, later, uh, people examined phase uh, diagrams with uh, support vector machines and found that uh, these support vector machines, even though they cannot be applied to uh, uh, systems that are as complicated as the systems that uh, could be examined with uh, feed, uh, straightforward feedforward neural networks, uh, in these simple systems, you can uh, interpret uh, what, uh, support vector, what the support vector machine has learned and figure out uh, the underlying order of, uh, these, of the underlying uh, substances. Uh, another one was uh, uh, an extension of the feedforward neural network, uh, where they exchanged some of the layers by recurrent layers and they were able to examine dynamical systems and dynamical phase transitions. Um, if we come to uh, unsupervised learning, the first method that was proposed was principal component analysis, which is so easy that it's barely, uh, barely machine learning. Uh, it's uh, just uh, statistical methods uh, that we were, uh, will discuss uh, later very briefly. And uh, the main advantage of this method is that it's so, e so it's so easy to apply and it's uh, very easy to interpret. However, uh, it is in its standard form, it can only learn linear features in, uh, uh, of the samples. And uh, if you, uh, if you ex expand it to kernel principle component analysis, you lose many of the benefits that, uh, uh, that you gain uh, when you just use normal uh, principle component analysis. Uh, the next one is the autoencoder approach, with, which was uh, proposed by me uh, two years ago, uh, <coughs> which is the first uh, unsupervised uh, neural network uh, that was tasked to do uh, uh, face recognition. And the last one is uh, uh, a hybrid scheme, learning by confusion, where you uh, mislabel your data and uh, you check how well your uh, neural network performs on your mislabeled data and uh, if you uh, mislabel your data in an optimal way you can still see the phase transition. So uh, while we are uh, going to, uh, so in, in this talk we are going to, to uh, apply feedforward neural networks, principal component analysis and autoencoders to Monte Carlo samples uh, the last part of the talk will be dealing with uh, feed-forward neural networks. So I think if we come to the point where uh, we will find new physics using these machine learning approaches, I'm uh, I'm very convinced that it will be done, uh, will be achieved by standard feed-forward neural networks. However, uh, these networks are the least interpretable. So we have no clue what what they do, and that is why the last uh, part of the of the talk is focused on uh, interpreting feed-forward neural networks in the context of physical phase transitions. Just a question. Yeah? Surely people are trying to go with neural networks, so especially on these 2D phase Okay, uh, if, I, if I say feed-forward neural networks, I also already include convolutional neural networks. Oh, okay. So, yeah? Um, so if you train in a supervised manner, how yeah. do you expect to uh, discover something new? 
satisfy the neural network? Okay, so there, there are different opinions. Some, some people uh, think you should always start with unsupervised learning because uh, if you're if it's a new system and uh, you don't have you don't have a clue what is what is happening, then uh, the neural network should figure it out. Uh, then there are, uh, there is there are the other people who believe uh, unsupervised learning should should be a, a tool that you use to find some traces of phase transitions. But we also know that uh, supervised uh, learning neural networks in this context are way more powerful than any of the unsupervised methods. So you use unsupervised learning first uh, to discover traces of phase transitions, pin down the phase transitions with supervised learning, and then there are other people who have other reasons to assume that there is a phase transition and they start with supervised learning. So it's all equally valid depending on the context. Okay, so if you have already a suspicion that there is yeah. something, then you can create the appropriate training data yeah. and nail down the exact yeah. stuff. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, there's just one problem. Uh, if you if you do that, uh, so you 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 look at your system, you assume that there is a phase transition, and if you uh, if you if you if you are very convinced that there is a phase transition, you are already biased as a researcher, and you can just push so hard that the neural network eventually finds something, and then it yeah, then you would publish a wrong result. But, I mean, following on that, is there is there a study where this is like in the Isaac, for instance, with the magnetic field, you know, there is a change from minus to plus magnetization, but there is no phase transition with the temperature is high enough. I mean, but if you train a neural network, would you still see a phase transition in, this, in the way you define it? Oh, like, what, I'm what, wondering what, how do you distinguish between crossover and phase transition with these approaches. Yeah, in this sense you cannot. No. So if you, if you assume if, if your data shows a crossover, but you assume that there is a phase transition, your neural network will find, uh, you cannot distinguish uh, if there is a crossover or a phase transition in this right. sense. But in the end, in the end it's, uh, uh, it's uh, so, uh, so all, all these data, so, mm, so we're not in, so in all of these finite systems, we don't have a real phase transition. So everything looks like a crossover since everything is washed out. If you have a lot of critical temperature, you have a certain scaling of the system size. I mean, yeah. if you don't have a graph, you can't detect this with your network. You can't distinguish this with your network methods. So you can't. So uh, there's a 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 calculate the susceptibility for different uh, lattice sizes and extrapolate to the thermodynamic limit. That's what you can do. Still. Yeah. And, and people do that. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And they, they do that too. So for example, uh, you you formulate a susceptibility of the prediction probability and uh, since it turns out that uh, uh, these methods learn order parameters uh, in the end it turns out that if you, uh, if, you, if, you, if you do the standard approach with uh, the neural network results you, uh, you get what you expect when you uh, so you get the same results as if you would do the standard approaches with the, with the magnetization and the order parameters. Well, but the standard approaches can distinguish a crossover from a phase transition by seeing whether there is an actual divergence with the system size or not, right? But this is not usually done in any of these works as far as I no. know. Okay. No. So it could be that uh, uh, that in, in these works, you uh, so the transition is uh, if if you're really successful, the transition is really sharp. So you would assume that that it's a phase transition. But I've also seen results where uh, the phase transition looks very washed out, 
<coughs> but it, it should be a phase transition, but uh, the results look like a crossover. But you can, you can have a look at the results later uh, and uh, you, can, you can judge for yourself what, what you see here. And all results that I, that I show here are uh, phase transitions. So, uh, the first method that we apply to the Monte Carlo configurations are uh, feed-forward artificial neural networks. So, uh, we, we, all know, we all know what they are. Uh, uh, I just put it here because uh, later we are dealing with the intrinsics of a neural network in order to interpret them. So, uh, it's a directed uh, uh, forward graph. Uh, this is our input data. Each x is a data point. We have n data points. To each of the axes uh, corresponds to the corresponding label. Uh, our neural network is just a function that depends on all the parameters of the weights and the biases in all, all different layers. <coughs> and the goal while training is we choose WIJ and BIJ such that uh, the output uh, of the neural network matches the, the real label in the, uh, in the sense of uh, supervised learning. And we can apply the speed forward neural network to a bunch of uh, data, that, uh, a bunch of Monte Carlo data, uh, Monte Carlo samples. So uh, if, if we do that, we produce in uh, the phase diagram where we already assume that there is a phase transition. Can you specify what's in this case what are your x and your y? Uh, on what? What are your x and your y on your train? Ah, uh, so, just yeah, that, that, no, 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 uh, that is exactly what I'm, what I'm just, just uh, telling you. Uh, so, uh, X is uh, a collection of uh, all these Monte Carlo samples, images of, uh, um, of uh, spin configurations. So, uh, black means it's been up, white means it's been down, and uh, the label, the Y, is uh, zero if you're uh, in one phase, and uh, one if you are in the other phase. Uh, so you train your neural network in this regime uh, on all the configurations and all the Monte Carlo configurations that are labeled zero and uh, in this, this regime uh, on Monte Carlo configurations that are labeled as one. But you don't have any, uh, any data, uh, any trading data on the intermediate regime. And if you are successfully trained after successfully training, you test your neural network on Monte Carlo samples uh, in, in the intermediate regime and uh, you find that uh, if you uh, uh, calculate the average prediction uh, per temperature that there is a, uh, the neural network is very accurate and there is a very steep change at the phase transition uh, which is very close to the uh, exact estimate of the phase transition that we know uh, by Onsaga's exact result. So, uh, in this sense, we conventionally say that the phase transition is at the point where the cl average classifi uh, classification probability is at 0 0.5. Uh, but, uh, so you see it in this plot, so uh, this line could not be sharper it is only a slight tilt because uh, of, the, uh, of the points, of the temperature points where we produce the Monte Carlo samples. So if we, if we would have produced Monte Carlo samples which were uh, closer, uh, uh, closer uh, with a closer distance in temperature and uh, in the thermal uh, and on bigger lattice sizes, it, uh, the average prediction cl uh, classific uh, the average classification probability would look like uh, uh, like the like the red line. You don't actually know that, right? Because you uh, didn't try so big sizes. I, I did not know. But uh, so if you if you go to higher sizes it uh, it converges. So the green line converges to the to the red line. Yeah? So how does the network know that there is a very sharp transition and not something it's more smooth. Yeah, exactly. That is, that, is, didn't train there, so. that is exactly that is uh, that is exactly the, the right the right way to think about this. So if you uh, uh, normally you don't you don't have something in between. So you uh, your, the function that uh, that the neural network uh, 
learns in there could 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 look like like this or uh, be be something completely wrong, and uh, uh, that is why we examine what the neural network learns uh, uh, to produce these phase diagrams. So if uh, the neural network would learn something different, then uh, we uh, so. It is a real possibility that the neural network learns something like, uh, what, like what you say, and in some cases, if you are not, uh, if you have not trained successfully, uh, you get these curves. You get uh, oh, you get curves that that look like, uh, for example, in this in this picture, if you trained from zero, trained data from zero to one and four point five, you get uh, you get uh, just just lines that uh, that are uh, smoothly connected, but. Uh, just just interpolate from uh, in, on a straight line from one to four, and uh, if you examine that that closely, you find that uh, uh, the neural network either learns something unphysical or uh, some uh, uh, artifacts of your Monte Carlo simulation, or uh, it could learn the temperature. But the temperature is no uh, it is physical, but the temperature by itself has no knowledge about the phases. So if the neural network just gives you uh, the temperature and adds some bias to it, uh, you would never uh, be able to predict the phase transition there. So that is, that is exactly a really important point uh, to think about that. Uh, so there, there are reasons why I think the neural network learns what, what it does, but that is more for discussion, so this is not, not, not proven yet. But we can, we can talk about this after, after the talk. Um, so now we have discussed uh, supervised uh, artificial feed-forward neural networks. Uh, another simple way of calculating phase diagrams in an unsupervised uh, manner is we uh, give uh, a principal component uh, analysis, uh, the whole data set uh, in all temperature ranges, and uh, see what uh, the main principal components uh, on these on this, on this data sets are. So what is principal component analysis? So suppose we have uh, uh, an array of mean centered data. Uh, we calculate the uh, uh, covariance matrix. This co co covariance matrix is symmetric. And uh, then the spectral theorem tells us that uh, symmetric matri uh, matrices can be orthogonally, orthogonally mm -hmm. diagonalized. Uh, the eigenvalues are the variances. Uh, if you order them, the corresponding eigenvectors are the principal component such that the first principal component corresponds to the uh, largest variance. And uh, if you apply principal component analysis to uh, your uh, Monte Carlo config configurations, you find that uh, the first uh, principal component with the largest variance uh, is perfectly correlated to the magnetization. So, in this sense, uh, we can interpret the machine learning algorithm and uh, we can say that principal component analysis learns the magnetization. So, uh, in this sense, we... Uh, so, since the results of the principal component analysis are, uh, is, is the magnetization, we can do all the standard approaches, we can calculate uh, susceptibilities using this uh, you can, uh, you can you can do all the same things. You can plot it uh, with uh, respect to the to the temperature. Can I ask? And, yeah. Because usually in data processing, when you apply PCA, you center your data so that the mean is zero. Is yeah. that done here as well? Oh. Uh, um, so if if I would not have used mean centered data. All the uh, all the equations on the slides uh, would would have been longer. That is why, in order to explain to you in a very condensed way, I just assume that the data is that we put uh, mean centered data through this. But yeah, you're right. They need uh, data in in standard libraries. Uh, data gets uh, automatically centered. Uh, yeah. Um, if you plot the results of the principal component analysis. Uh, uh, versus the temperature, uh, you can see a little uh, smooth phase transition, so you cannot exactly pin the phase transition down, uh, but uh, that is what you uh, can do with supervised learning. You can uh, 
do the same with vari variational autoencoders. So variational autoencoders uh, is a network that consists of an encoder network, a decoder network. Um, in here, uh, you have uh, latent variables that uh, uh, follow a predefined probability distribution. Normally, it's assumed that it's, uh, the latent variables are uh, Gaussian distributed. And uh, the objective when training a uh, variational autoencoder is that the uh, uh, of an autoencoder is that the output should be as close as possible to the input. So uh, the autoencoder tries to reproduce the input as accurately as possible, which is why in the objective, uh, the objective, the loss function consists of the reconstruction loss, and uh, in addition. Um, uh, you have this term, uh, you have the callback uh, lipo divergence, which forces your latent variables uh, to, uh, to equal a uh, normally distributed Gaussian. Uh, in addition to that, you have this beta parameter, which uh, is a characteristic of the disentangled variational autoencoder. Uh, when I introduced that, uh, I just introduced it as a hyperparameter uh, so that the results get better. Uh, more detailed uh, description is. Uh, uh, in the paper by Irina Higgins, uh, where they introduced uh, the beta or disentangled variational autoencoder and uh, they, where they justified uh, this beta on a uh, more strict basis. And if you apply uh, the variational autoencoder to, your, to all your Monte Carlo samples on uh, the whole temperature range, you also find that uh, the optimal latent dimension is 1. You also find that uh, the latent parameter is uh, very strongly correlated to the magnetization. So we can also say that the variation autoencoder learns the magnetization. The latent parameter is clustered. So uh, in the latent space, uh, if you draw a histogram, uh, the yellow bars correspond to the uh, to the uh, to the broken phase and uh, the so the uh, ferromagnetic phase and uh, uh, the histogram showing the red part corresponds to the uh, to the paramagnetic phase. If you again uh, um, uh, if you if you again compare uh, the average of the magnetization and the latent parameter and uh, uh, on the uh, average over each temperatures, uh, you can again see uh, that there is a that there's a phase transition. Uh, however, uh, if you want to pin that down, uh, I advise to use supervised neural networks. And uh, this leads us uh, to the point where uh, we have seen that uh, uh, principal component analysis and uh, uh, variation and autoencoders learn physical, me physically meaningful parameters in order to, uh, to distinguish between all the data points we have, uh, uh, until now, no clue what a supervised learning neural network does. However, we have also seen that uh, supervised learning before neural network gives uh, you way more accurate results. And uh, so uh, the topic of, the, of this last talk is to, uh, to check what the supervised uh, learning neural network is doing uh, when it is tasked with classifying phases. Yeah. Why did you use the EAE and not just the regular autoencoder? Uh, so, on the one hand, uh, which was clear later, so, uh, so the, the real, so the more proper explanation is because uh, using a disentangled variation autoencoder, uh, you get an interpret interpretable uh, latent representation. But by then, when I wrote the paper, uh, the paper on disentangled VAEs did not exist. So, or it was there, but it was published a few weeks ago and I did not know. And I did it because uh, the, uh, the latent representation uh, did not very accurate, accurately correspond to the magnetization. So if you, if you compare these both approaches, uh, 
the justification is experimentally. So the AAE would also have learned to reconstruct it, but you wouldn't have mapped it on the Gaussian and latent dimension or at the bottleneck. So, so the, 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 correlation, the correlation of the, uh, uh, of the, normal in, uh, of the latent variables of the normal autoencoder uh, 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 are not correlated to the magnetization as, uh, as accurately as the latent variables in the uh, variation autoencoder case. But it can still, it works equally well. So there's so another, another linear combination of magnetization, other observables that also allows you to reproduce. So you could, if, you, if, you, uh, if you have no clue, then you do not know what the, uh, what the latent representation means. So in a, in a physical system where you don't, do not know what happens, you can still uh, uh, plot it, uh, plot the temperature, uh, plot it versus, versus the temperature and you would still uh, see a change roughly at the phase transition. So it would still work. But it would not learn, so the approximation of the order parameter would be worse. Is that, is that satisfying? Yeah, I'm just wondering why. Why, why. why does the Gaussian distribution at the bottleneck lead to learning magnetization? Okay. Uh, um, so I think in this case it just act, acts as a regularization. I have no no deeper insight into this. Yeah. Okay. So what is our notion of interpretability in this sense? So uh, if you uh, want to interpret V4 neural networks, that, that is a that is in general a quite quite hard task. And uh, uh, when we started this. Uh, we were considering standard methods like uh, looking at the weights or uh, doing belief backpropagation, but uh, on the one hand, they were uh, they were hard to apply, and on the other hand, even if successful, it would not have been the results of these interpretation methods would not have been enough for us to uh, to understand what the uh, what the physical uh, uh, what complicated physical parameters are in these neural networks. That, that is why, what, what led us to think about uh, how can we interpret what a neural network does in a, uh, from a different perspective. And uh, if you just assume that if the neural network bases its decision on one single quantity or observable, then uh, if this observable is bigger, then the classification probability gets larger. If it's smaller, then the classification probability is reduced. And if two inputs have the same value of this observable, they must have the same classification probability. So this means that there uh, exists a, a bijective function with uh, which you can map the neural network output to this observable. So f is the function applied to a spin config uh, or a physical config Monte Carlo configuration. And uh, f, the small f, is the function uh, that gives you <coughs> this bijective uh, uh, mapping. Uh, q is the observable evaluated on the spin configuration s. How can we? Uh, wh why? Why is this useful? So in general, uh, when machine learning is tasked with uh, uh, distinguishing faces or cars and trees and dogs, uh, there are so many different things that a neural network learns, but uh, in the context of uh, physical systems, uh, it makes sense to think about uh, the output of a neural network in this way, because in physics we uh, often have only very few character characteristic features of these phase transitions. For example, the renormalization group tells us that we have many, many irrelevant uh, parameters which uh, 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 flow towards the fixed point, so they, uh, they die out and uh, don't... Uh, uh, they, they uh, don't uh, correspond to the uh, measurable order parameters which what, with what we uh, uh, measure if we're in one phase or another phase. Physical quantities are uh, uh, uniquely formulated by well-defined formulas. So uh, if, you, if you imagine what is the formula of a, co uh, of a, of a cat or a dog, I have no, I have no clue. But uh, if, I, if I see a formula uh, of a physical quantity, uh, I, can, I can relate to that because that is how we got, that's how we learned to write down uh, 
physics, that is how we deal with physics in, in terms of these well, uh, well defined formulas. Um, these physical quantities are often highly symmetric. So, uh, value by rotational symmetry, translational symmetry. Um, so, that means uh, even though these physical formulas are very uh, uh, are encoded in a very complicated manner in the uh, in the neural network, if you check for all of these symmetries, uh, it turns out that uh, m many of the weights can be shared. Many of the connections in the neural network uh, don't need to be present to model this quantity. Uh, and if, so if you probe for, for all of these symmetries, you can uh, write down a reduced capacity neural network uh, that only has a few uh, independent parameters. And in the end, the idea is our uh, way of interpreting a neural network perform a, re a regression on the parameters that are left. So for, for this purpose, we define this interpretation net. This uh, interpretation net starts uh, as an input, you take a sample configuration. The uh, lowest neural network is the most general neural network uh, that you can define. In this interpretation net, in this image, we test for a translational symmetry. Uh, so what, what happens is uh, this blue box is a, uh, is a complete convolutional neural network. Uh, here we have an averaging layer which destroys all the information about the ab about locality. So uh, the neural network forgets at this point uh, which information came from which point. Uh, and the idea is now we reduce the capacity of this neural network and uh, see. So we, we cut some connections. Uh, we enforce symmetry and uh, we check if so. And, and we train it again and, and we check if the neural network converges to the same loss after, uh, after being successfully trained, then we assume the neural network had, has not lost any important information about uh, the good quantities that uh, it needed to figure out on a sample configuration in order to classify the phases. However, if we, uh, if we, if we cut more and more connections, if we uh, uh, reduce the capacity of the neural network too far, there will be a point, if you train the neural network again, that uh, the, uh, after convergence, the uh, loss will not be as small as it has been uh, when, uh, as, as it was previously. So in this case, uh, we assume that the neural network has lost one important detail about uh, the features that it uses to classify phases. And, uh, we are looking for the minimal neural network that still achieves the same loss value. And uh, so uh, it has the least number of parameters, is uh, the most symmetric, but it still achieves still the same classification pro uh, performance as uh, the original uh, most general neural network. If we, uh, if we do that in the case of the easing model, uh, so we start by a, a feed-forward neural network with uh, convolutional uh, layers uh, and full receptive field. So we, as, as previously, we trained a neural network labeled uh, with samples generated in this regime, labeled with zero, and uh, uh, samples in this regime labeled with one. Uh, we train until, until fully converged, we, re we remember the loss value, and then uh, we cut some connections in the neural network. So uh, this, uh, what, what we see here, this is a, a spin configuration. Uh, each of these uh, points are, uh, 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 corresponds to a lattice side. Uh, the, the black line uh, means uh, the receptive field of uh, all of these Subnetworks is the is the full lattice, so the neural network has the capacity to learn all possible correlations on the spin sample. If we train it, then uh, we we see if it has the full receptive field size, it converges it to, to a training loss which is six uh, times ten to the power of minus four, which is uh, very uh, very close to zero in our sense. If we now reduce the capacity of the neural network step by step, uh, 
so in, in this uh, in this table, you only uh, see the uh, the most important reductions of the neural network. So if we reduce uh, the receptive field size of the neural network so far that it can only see uh, neighboring spins, then it still converges to the same or almost the same uh, training loss. So, uh, uh, and uh, in, in this sense, uh, we assume that the neural network has only lo lost very minor information about uh, what was needed to classify phases. So uh, any further information was not needed by the neural network and is not the, co the dominant quantity that, that was learned. So it could be, and uh, so it, it will be that there are minor contributions that we do not see with this interpretation method. However, uh, we will find uh, one or two uh, dominant quantities that the neural network learns in order to uh, distinguish between phases. So we have found that the structure of uh, or the receptive field size that the neural network needs is one, one times two, so it uh, just sees neighboring spins. And now we can uh, write down the, uh, uh, the the neural network in terms of uh, uh, the least amount of parameters. So we use all the symmetry that we just probed for and we write the whole neural network, which is F applied to a spin sample S, as, uh, as all possible functions that it can be. So uh, this is the averaging layer. Uh, this function F is, uh, thank you, is the uh, function that uh, uh, is learned by uh, by the blue uh, neural network, and it is just applied to one single spin. Uh, if we perform a Taylor expansion of this function, we know that all the higher order terms can be reduced to lower order terms because uh, spins can take on values uh, minus one and one. Spin squared always gives you one, so all the higher order terms can be absorbed by the absorbed by lower order terms. Uh, so that we are only left with very few parameters. If we perform a regression on these parameters, we find that the neural network can be written as a sigmoid activation function times uh, one weight and one bias times this quantity. And uh, uh, this, this quantity uh, is, is known as the uh, magnetization. So, uh, in, in this case, uh, we have found that the neural network uses the magnetization to classify between phases and we have at no point uh, assumed that we know that uh, uh, the magnetization is a suitable order parameter that we can probe for. Can I ask you a yeah? I should have asked this probably before, but I mean, the quantity you have here is actually not an order parameter. At least you have to actually prove that it has, there is some region where it vanishes because it's a positive quantity and the average of a positive quantity is always positive. And I would have expected a thing without the absolute value to appear. Okay. Uh, it transforms non trivially and then the two of the easy model. And why, why does this appear? Okay. Uh, okay, I will just skip, skip ahead a few slides. Uh, what, what you're uh, thinking about is this plot. So uh, uh, what, what we see in this <coughs> picture is, uh, is the correlation between the output of the neural network, the latent prediction. So this is uh, the output uh, without the latest activation function, uh, without the last activation function, and uh, the correlation uh, between this and the magnetization. And uh, what you see here, you have two arms, if you look very closely. And one arm corresponds to the positive arm, and one corresponds to the negative arm. So the neural network learns the uh, absolute value. Which is not what happens in, in the case of unsupervised learning. In the unsupervised learning case, the neural network does not learn the absolute value. I mean, uh, all I'm saying, in, in the sense of spin models, this is not the standard order parameter of magnetization and stuff. 
you know, you, you have to, you, you, one can prove it, but you actually have to prove it and that in, in the infinite volume limit there is actually a phase where it is zero. Yeah. Well, that is positive, it also yeah. shows in, in the plots, but I, I, was, if, if, if I would have been happy if, 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 uh, if the network had somehow found out that it is the ordinary magnetization in the using model that is the order parameter and not the absolute value. But I understand now that you have somehow by supervision put, put in a, a... Yeah. Yeah. By supervision you force uh, that uh, the positive branches of the magnetization and negative branches uh, overlap in the prediction. Yeah. That is what you enforce by supervision, yeah. <coughs> So, uh, yeah, uh, if, we, if we go back to this point, so we, we found uh, two, uh, two steps where the neural network loses information. So one is from the magnetization to the baseline, and one is from the, uh, from the 1 times 2 uh, receptive field size to the 1 times 1 uh, neural network. So, uh, so far we have examined uh, the 1 times 1 neural network. If we examine the uh, 1 times 2 neural network and do exactly the same Taylor expansion, we also find that the neural network can be expressed in terms of uh, very few parameters, and uh, if we, uh, this is the, the function that uh, gives you all uh, all the functions that the uh, neural network is left with being able to learn. Uh, if we Taylor expand, uh, we find that uh, 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 higher order terms can be observed by lower order terms, and the only new term that we see is uh, is this term in the Taylor expansion. So that already uh, gives us a hint that uh, uh, the neural network learns the energy. If we perform an explicit regression, we find that uh, the neural network, in this case, is again sigmoid activation function times the weight plus bias times uh, one fourth of the energy. And it's just one fourth because uh, in the minimum neural network, we assume each spin side occurs only once in each of the, uh, as, an, as an input of the neural networks. So uh, if we forget about, so in, in the energy we have, uh, uh, we have a connection to all the neighboring spins, which are four, but the neural network uh, in the minimal, so the minimally expressed neural network only assumes one connection to neighboring spin, that is why we find uh, one fourth of the energy, but uh, it is still, it is still the energy, and uh, if we put this all together, we find that the dominant quantity is that a neural network learns in order to distinguish between phases is, uh, on the one hand, the magnetization, on the other hand, uh, the energy. We can plot, uh, we can uh, confirm this this deduction by plotting correlation plots uh, of these uh, smaller subnetworks. However, we cannot plot this for the full network because then the uh, these both uh, uh, parameters mix, and uh, uh, in this plot we have several thousand points, and uh, uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't see a correlation at all. So now we're finally at uh, at an interesting physical system. Uh, we're left with five more minutes, so uh, uh, we want to uh, we want to examine uh, uh, the confinement phase transition in QCD. However, that is way too complicated. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we put the quarks, the heavy quarks, on a static, static lattice. So the uh, quarks are uh, infinitely heavy, so uh, uh, they don't move. They, uh, we, don't, we do not account for any of, the, of their quark fluctuations. Uh, the uh, gluons that uh, uh, carry the, the uh, strong force between the quarks are uh, characterized by link matrices uh, connecting uh, lattice, sizes, uh, lattice sites. Um, in the case of uh, uh, QCD, and, uh, they can be described by uh, SU3 matrices. However, this is too complicated for our case, and uh, which is why uh, we uh, examine the confinement phase transition in SU2 lattice gauge theory. So, this, uh, if this looks way too complicated, it does not matter. I will just briefly tell you what it is. This is the Wilson, Wilson action, uh, the action on the lattice. Uh, what this contains is uh, the 
uh, uh, the sum over uh, all the smallest possible uh, all the smallest possible loops if you uh, if you go uh, uh, just like this uh, around one plaquette. Uh, all of each of these matrices is a matrix in SU2, and uh, each of uh, these matrices can be described by four real parameters. These four uh, real parameters are the input for our neural network. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so after having performed the Monte Carlo simulation, uh, we uh, uh, apply unsupervised learning to uh, find uh, about the existence of a phase transition. So far, uh, variational autoencoders have not been successful at all. They didn't find a phase transition. PCA was successful. However, uh, we know PCA can only find linear order parameters and uh, all the uh, uh, physical quantities that we know that we can calculate are uh, non-linear. So if we plot uh, the uh, uh, results for the principal component analysis versus uh, uh, the lattice coupling B, we see that there is a steep jump. However, if we check for any of the uh, uh, or known physical uh, correlation between any of the known physical quantities uh, and, the, uh, and the principal component, we, we cannot find any correlation. So uh, that is why we think uh, the principal component analysis has not found any, uh, any deep physical insight about these uh, Monte Carlo configurations. However, we can now do supervised learning. Uh, so remember I told you uh, four, four neural networks are way more uh, powerful. This is also one of the reasons why I think it, because supervised learning, uh, uh, four neural networks are way more successful in finding the phase transition. And we see the results on the next slide. So if we apply uh, supervised learning, uh, again, like in the easy model, we find a very steep change which could be more accurate, however, our Monte Carlo simulations were not uh, quite accurate. So the neural networks uh, agree very well with uh, the lattice uh, calculation. Uh, we can now again interpret, thanks, almost, almost good, uh, this neural network in the same manner that we interpret the uh, neural network that was uh, tasked with classifying phases in the easy model. Uh, we can start with a full neural network, train it, remember the loss, reduce the capacity of the neural network, train it again, train it again, and find a minimal neural network with only a few parameters, and uh, check for different uh, re regression approaches, which were best, and uh, uh, the uh, best regression scheme that we found had uh, 561 trims, which is way less than the parameters in the neural network. Uh, if we write down what the, neural, uh, what, uh, the regression uh, finds, uh, if it agrees with the output of the neural network, uh, it's, uh, <coughs> an, uh, uh, so the output is this, in an ordered manner, uh, so all the uh, 557, uh, 55 terms in between are smaller than 0 0.25 and uh, bigger than minus 2.8, uh, so we assume that all these uh, are just approximation errors, and these are the leading terms, uh, which are almost of the same size, and if we write that down, uh, we find that the neural network uses this function in order to, so this function put in here, uh, to classify between these phases, and uh, we know this function, uh, this function is the Polyakov loop. And, uh, we can all, uh, since we on, only found one quantity, we can now compare it to the full network, and we see even though the full network learns a bit more, uh, it's still perfectly correlated to the Polyakov loop. So we, uh, we have now confirmed that uh, the neural network learns the Polyakov loop in order to distinguish between phases in this case. And as an added bonus, uh, we have constructed the Polyakov loop without prior knowledge. So uh, this method can then even be used to uh, uh, find out about order parameters if you do not know them before. This uh, uh, is then the end of my talk. Uh, so machine learning is capable of producing phase diagrams for many physical systems. Uh, neural networks are now no longer a black box algorithm in the context of order par parameter-based phase transitions. Uh, 
I, ha I have not examined uh, any systems uh, that show a different phase transition, so I don't know what uh, the interpretation uh, tells us what uh, neural networks learn in these cases. Uh, neural networks learn the same quantities that we humans use, so uh, like uh, Landau's order parameter or Ehrenfest's uh, uh, classification in the sense of the energy. Uh, and in some cases, we can determine the nature of these phases by constructively interpreting what neural networks learn. So, thanks for your attention. In principle, nothing, nothing is stopping us. It is just uh, uh, so far uh, there were only papers published where the neural network results uh, agree with the results from other uh, other methods. But there are also people who have applied uh, neural networks to to systems that they know where they where the neural network results do not agree with the results from previous methods. So uh, we have a very a huge publication bias, and uh, if we now assume Isn't there a work by Titus Neupert where he applied it to some manipulative localization system where we don't really know whether there is a phase transition? So, uh, uh, I, I yeah, uh, so uh, yeah, if I remember correctly, he's he yeah, he was one of the people who uh, uh, applied neural networks to the many body localization pr uh, uh, phase transition. Uh, there were many papers uh, where they tried to f uh, locate this phase transition. The first one was uh, 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 was by Ebert, uh, Van Muyenburg, and Sebastian Huber, uh, where they introduced the phase transition by confusing uh, a confusion, where they also uh, calculated the phase transition in many-body localization. However, uh, this phase transition was known so the exact in the, in the exact same model someone calculated the phase transition half a year ago uh, half a year before they published their machine learning paper so that was was quite close but uh, in the in in these papers so i uh, i know Everett's paper uh, they did a lot of feature engineering so they did not uh, train on raw data which helps a lot so the the hardest step for all these uh, uh, neural networks is usually the uh, the transformation uh, from raw configurations to reasonable physical features. Any further questions? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Taylor expansion was done for the entire network as a whole, uh, with respect to the inputs. Or so. It, uh, Yes, but it was already done for the net, for the network that had a very reduced capacity. And it, so uh, the main motivation was uh, we 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 know that uh, that we only see very few terms since uh, spin squared are always one. So the Taylor expansion uh, is very short in this case. Yeah. Yes. W would it be really more complicated to construct Taylor expansion for the full ne neural network? Yeah. Yeah, it would. Uh, yeah, because even in the in the first order approximation, you would have the correlations between all uh, all the input variables. So you would have, uh, in order to to write that down, you would. Uh, uh, have, uh, if n is the number of uh, the inputs of a, of one configuration, you would have at first order at least n squared numbers to write that down. And if you go to a higher order, so it rises quite quite fast to write down a Taylor expansion in these cases. So, isn't it possible to train your own network if you already know the order parameters specifically on the on predicting the order parameter? Like for instance, in quantum chromodynamics, we know yeah. that we would uh, expect the 
comparison to breaking or restoration in the dense space where yeah. we don't know anything and we yeah. like to know something about this. So can we train at the, I don't know, imaginary chemical potential, uh, the neural network and then perform this analytic continuation uh, with the help of neural networks? Uh, can it, so, uh, uh, it's slightly more than the naive approach with analytic continuation in chemical uh, so I, I, I don't know. So e extrapolation with so I, I don't trust ex extrapolation with neural networks. And then we have the we have the problem that that, that you mentioned before uh, uh, when we that you mentioned when we uh, were discussing uh, the the region where we did not train, which is quite big. Uh, this is if this is not controlled, we I don't know how to trust these results. Then, well, of course, you can do that, and you will get some results, but. I, I don't see how to trust these results. I mean, this is a bit problematic because in other classification tasks we often uh, observe overconfidence of the network. So the transition is sharper than yeah. it ought to be if we compare to ground truth labels. And I mean, if this happens in your case as well, then it would just pretend to have a sharp uh, phase transition, but it's a Artifacts. So, how how can you make sure that this is not just overconfidence? Yeah, but that was somewhat a point of the talk, right? That you can't be sure, and you have to implement some sort of trust mechanism. That was my understanding. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so, so, but I, I think this question would, for example, be valid uh, if you if you want to distinguish between cro crossovers and phase transitions. So if you if there is only crossover present and the neural network would be overconfident, then uh, the transition would be sharper and would look like a phase transition. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, in in the sense that you say, uh, I I totally agree. But I also see that there could be problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I can maybe give also some example of a work where So here we try to train on one lattice size. And make prediction of the order parameter <coughs> and bigger at this size, so the phase and order parameter. And here, in fact, we see the opposite that the place where the phase transition should be gets wider. So it it's no, doesn't really know where it is. And in fact, it also bias towards the lowest at this size. So here we are trying to look at this minus and how you can try to extrapolate to size the load. It needs to be bigger. Okay, I propose we send the speaker again.